by now you should have all the information for your um, fabric identification. And we did the burn tests last week. So first of all, I'm just gonna show you this really fun thing. Uh, we had a meeting, a, the Santa Barbara Foundation is hosting conversations with different departments and they did one with music a couple of weeks ago and they've done them with all different kinds. They did one with nursing because it was gonna be on COVID-19, but they wanted to do one on theater. And so ours was last Thursday afternoon and it was really fun. Katie was in the Garvin Theater. I was here in the costume studio and Ben Krop was in the scenic studio. So I talked from here and I talked about um, the students each, if you were here, you'd each have a sewing machine um, that this dress, which is from in the next room, which is 1870s. Just a second, let me see if I can get it right. There we go. I had it pre-set up was built by students and appeared on stage and actually has some trick things which I'm gonna show you. And then I said, and we really appreciate our community members who donate and clothes, which is a 1960s, a 50s and a 40s um, ensemble, which had been donated by our community members. They're so gracious to us and then we can use them on stage and we do a wide variety of other kinds of things besides period shows. And sometimes we do Beauty and the Beast. And here's one of the characters that was from a show called 10 Red Kings. And this is a mask that was made by a student. I'll pull them up so you can see them. And so this is a silicone mask that was made with uh, teeth out of either warbla or probably um, there's a plastic material which is uh, heat sensitive and you can just create shapes with it. And of course, these are some skeleton pieces put on top of shoulder pads and then accented with fur. And then you can see down the back, the a uh, mask had a really cool blue hair and had these fingers sticking out. And there were three trolls. Wait a second, this must have gone up here. Oh yeah, this must have gone up here and covered that. So anyway, there were, it was called the 10 Red Kings and there were three trolls that were, I can't remember if they invaded the campers or what they did. And then at the end, I gave them a little dance and a twirl. So. This was um, ours and uh, you know, presentation is everything so that I could stand here and then reveal it to them. And that becomes something that is more interesting and exciting. So you want to always think about presentation. You want to think about how does the, um, how does the, audience, who is your audience, and how does the audience think about what you're presenting. So I thought that might be kind of fun for you guys to see. And then they got to see the costume studio and see the scenic, uh, the scenic studio, the scene shop, and the Garvin Theater. So hopefully you'll see it, Santa Barbara Foundation. And when it's published, they edit it together, and then it'll be published, and then I'll show it to you. Okay, I'm going to go to the other area now. Oh, I didn't even touch it and it did it by itself. So, okay. Um, let's review the, I just want to review the fabric identification project because we're done with it. And we can go to the campus site and make sure that you have all the information for that. So let's Pam, go. yeah, I just had a question about the fabric identification sheets. Should we, um, uh, submit those online or can we put them in the binder with the sewing? What what are the options? Just yes. wasn't clear on that. Yeah, very good. Actually, you know, uh, let me see. Let's When we go to the site, we can look at exactly what we have there. But yes, I think if you want to put them into your binder and if you want to submit them in person, you can do that just outside on the costume patio, no problem. And if you want to submit it virtually, then just um, photograph each page. And I think 
I'm trying to remember if I have my, uh, if I have my, hey, which page I have moved down here so that I can show you. So let me uh, get that together. But yeah, I think that you can, let's see how we have it on our Canvas site, okay? Okay, great. Let me screen share that. Oh, it's a second. The zoom, if you put the zoom too low, then you can't see the screen share and then. <clears throat> okay. The fabric chapter in the book was very interesting. Yes, isn't it great? Okay, so yeah, I I learned a lot reading through that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really important that we look really at a lot of great information there. Good. Okay, just a second. I have to do one quick thing. Let's go to that. Okay, Smenson, did you get yours looked at? Your what was that? The you get your um, eye fabric identification. Yeah, I think. I think it's correct, but I think I missed like one. Okay, so here's the compilation of it. This is the description. Mm -hmm. So everyone should have these pieces for it. And let me just open this up. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to stretch it. There we go. So that you guys can see it more carefully. Okay. Um, reading down that, I have to do one quick send. Just a second. So this is how you're going to organize it. First, you're going to do your paper weaves. So everyone should have had those at least. And also, um, you could do a lot of extra credit there. Each one gives one extra credit option. And they need to be mounted so that they can go into your book. And then you weave samples. Each fabric piece corresponds to the numbered description that you got in your book, but also in your packet, but also it's on the website as on the Canvas site as well. So put your fabric sample page. So plain weave sample. I'll see if I can pick that up. Plain weave sample page like this goes behind your plain weave sample that says your paper weave. And that way you can see the macro view of it and it gives you a lot of information about it. Did anybody do it? Well, never mind. I'm going to get to that at the end. Then you will do three burn tests from samples that are not included in your. Um, not included in your handbook. So you're gonna find three samples to burn up at home. <clears throat> That's really fun. And ours, mine looked like this. And I have them here to mount. So you can put, you know, pretty big samples on if you wanna have that. And then I have one that has almost no residue. Another one. I have this one, but I, I can't even see the part that burned up. So you want to put those on and guess, right, what they are. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. Three thread samples. And we talked about, you know, you might find a yarn sample. You might find a, um, you have thread that was sent to you and then one other kind of thread sample. So there are some choices, write an introduction. Okay, so let's, there's your weaves, your safety burn, blah, blah, blah. Here's your identification thing that's important. Oh, no, that's the rubric. Um, you do want to follow that, but we don't need to go over that, I don't think. I was trying to find. Oh, I know what it is. It's um, it's on the other. It's on the others page, which I'll show you is the lecture 
uh, the um, descriptions of each. Oh, maybe this is a sample. So these are your sample. And you want to number your samples so that you know that number one is the cheesecloth, number one A is the unbleached muslin, number two is the washed, washed muslin, okay? Because remember, we talked about sizing there. So that's how you want to number each of your squares and put your fabric piece on top of that. All right, and then let's minimize this and go down and see about the submission, which is Catherine's question. That's just a description. So let me edit that. It's going to take a minute. I probably erased everything now, right? There we go. Okay. So I want to get down here, which says, okay, all I have, I, I can't select online and in person, but let's just, just know that online, if I don't select online, then you can't submit it online, but it is selected for online, whether it's a text media you can take photos file upload, you can talk through it, you can make a little movie, put your camera on and film from this side, and then show me everything. Uh, go slowly so that I can look and match the pages. And then otherwise you can put it into your um, actual binder. And then you can ask, tell me that you're going to drop it off at this costume patio and that will work for me. And then that's due the 16th. Remember, there's no class on Wednesday because it is Veterans Day. So, oh, I was going to say, why is it due the 16th? So that's a week from today. All right. Any questions? That's one whole section. And then I was going to review, just a second, I have to do one quick thing, and I'm going to stop the recording for a moment. We're going to look at the crew handbook and see where everyone is because that's a, that's a project that you work on by yourself. The fabric identification we did all together and you need to be able to assemble those things based on the fabrics that you have. If you have any questions, you can also email me or um, we can meet virtually. But let's look at the crew handbook because this is something that, you're, that you have most of the information or all the information and then you need to um, keep working on it diligently as a background. So I'm going to hide you guys. Okay, and myself. No, let me do that. Okay. All right, let's go back to the crew handbook. So it's one of our three big sections. Let's see if this is the one that is the whole thing. Should be. So this is the, uh, when we discussed how to do character dressing lists, how to create a budget and develop a costume procurement plan and this is the Western costume rental form. Okay, let me go back. It must have been a discussion. Well, we discussed measurements because you do have measurements um, forms in your crew handbook. I'm just gonna go to modules so that I can get these in order. I'm looking for the page that actually has the whole I think it must have been earlier. Here it is. 
from sketch to stage. This is the, the full introduction, which we did about three weeks ago. So this is a way for you to learn work habits that are safe and efficient. So here's the multiple, um, the idea is to train wardrobe people to work backstage from beginning to end. So here's the contents of what you're looking for. And these are some things that we've discussed. Show calendar, you need to create measurement sheets and grid. So this is the, the grading for this crew handbook. You're writing your descriptions of your crew personnel and your crew, your backstage personnel, costume studio personnel, backstage personnel, and there's points there. And you have a cross plot, which actually I'll, I need to post that for you so that you can see what it is. The cross plot is, it's in Google form, which is not my favorite way. So it was Antigone is the play that we're working on for this. And then you did your tear sheets so that you remember Catherine showed us how to keynote or you can do a individual car showed us her collage for her two characters is as many and Antigone. You have a production calendar that you're going to fill in based on the calendar items. You can do it just on a Google calendar. You can type them in. We talked about the dressing list and the item list so that you're itemizing each character. I showed you that for Antigone. Also, I said you could do that for the man, that sketch of the man that I gave you. And then you can do a budget procurement plan for that. We have measurement forms, which I showed you how to measure, and a measurement schematic, which tells you where the measurements are. So we have just a couple of items left. I'm going to share these items, rehearsal report form and performance report form. And those will be something that you can just collect in your folder because those are ways that we communicate. And I'll show you what those look like. And then performance report is how did a performance go? And then creating, you've got your costume rental form from Western Costume and your check-in check-out list, which is based on the dressing list. So that's one last tidbit of lecture for how we um, work with it. But that you should have everything that you need for this now except number nine. I will send you number eight and I will send you number two, okay? Here's the calendar of items that you wanna put on your Google calendar. <coughs> and you can fill in dates based on what Antigone was. Um, Antigone is gonna start uh, November 12. So your show call would be November 12 if you wanna do that. Now this is a virtual show for our Antigone, but I would like you to think about it as though it was gonna be something in person. Question hey Pam, can we go over this a little bit? Cause I don't think we discussed it. So we need to- it's been a long time since we discussed it so yeah okay. so we're just like making a calendar and then we're going to put what our dates for all of these are and how the flow would go is that mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. okay all right pam is there a is there a due date on this because i didn't see it on the um due date I didn't see it in Canvas because I was looking last night. All right, hold on a minute. I'm. Um, let me do two things. Let me find the due date for you, and then also let me see if I can screen share both a calendar and these items. Okay. So let's go to. I'll open up two pages because you're on my desktop. We can do that. Okay, this is not the assignment. We have to find the assignment. I'll tell you when it's due right here. Oh no, not that. I hate it when I do that. Okay, so here's our due dates. 
Looking Back, Looking Forward, by the way, is extended. So if you didn't get a chance to see it, you should. So understanding the cross plot, dressing list procurement, we did that. Sewing portfolio was due. Here's our fabric ID. We're not um, doing the costume storage. We actually did that earlier when we went to the different costume houses uh, virtually. So I will post that map. Your fabric ID is due. Your crew handbook is due on the 23rd, right here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And maybe that's my fault. Let me just check and see if I have done, maybe I, I get so confused. Maybe I didn't do an assignment page, although I did all the lecture pages. So let's just go to there. And then we'll come back and answer the question about how to fill in the Google Calendar. I need one of these with the little pencil mark. And since it's not due for a long time, it might be at the very bottom. Okay, so what I need to do, it's the 23rd. is do an assignment page so you can upload your crew handbook. And it'll say that submit here. Can you also show me one more time where the papers are? Because I see the crew handbook recording, but I it doesn't have any links to mm -hmm. what you're just showing us. But I, I could probably be missing it. Nope. I think what I can do is just move these together. Oh, I see. Yeah, it was a while ago. Got yeah. It. So let's see if we do this and I have them together and I'll put them into, I'll put them into this week, actually. Okay. I'll make a new week and I'll put them in here. This is the one that get is a lot of the information. Yes. Okay. And then the next one. So instead of chronologically, they'll be by topic, which would make sense. Here's the, uh, when I discuss the dressing list and I can actually post, I can put in a hard copy of the Antigone because I showed it to you virtually. And then this is the Western costume form that you want. So I will upload to this page, either of these two pages, and then I will create an assignment page and it will be adjacent, okay? That'll be better. That makes more sense. So even if we do things chronologically in class, if the, if the syllabus says this is what we're doing this day, but these for Canvas, I think it's better if it's all together, right? So it makes it so it's not all spread out. That makes complete sense. Thank you for that note. Because it's a long project. Like a like a uh, a term paper, there we'll do different things at different times, but okay. So uh, I think. Is this the one that has a calendar? No, the previous one. Okay, so what I would do if I was going to do this calendar is open this up. I mean, this is what we do every time is how do you create a timetable and a deadline? And then let me just open up a second window because I have my desktop open so you can see files over here. And I'll open up a second window. And then let's see. 
Uh, I can. I don't think I can go to calendar from here. Let's see. You'll get my calendar, but we can make a, a blank calendar. I think we can make a blank calendar. Here we go. Okay, so if this is uh, if this is the start date, actually it's starting on the 12th, but let's say we can have it start on the 14th, Antigone. And then I'm looking at my calendar backwards. Sorry. And I'll tell you, Antigone is going to end on the 30th. So I can put here. Find a time. It doesn't matter when it is to me. I'm going to make it. 7 p.m. And I don't know if I can just type this in. What is my event? Add event. Okay, so there's my Antigone end date. Then I know that, and it's on here. Sorry, this little keypad is very sensitive. Oh, there was the filming for Antigone. Okay. So, and oh, you guys, this is like so frustrating. Sorry. Okay. There's 6.30 PM, my Antigone end date. Can't even do this. And then strike after the last show would mean we would go through it and we would, starting Tuesday, how long is it going to take to look at each item, check all the items in from the show, and we'll be getting our items back because they had a, uh, we'll be getting the costumes back that we had to check out to the actors. And we gave them a photo and an item list and a bag. So we're going to have to check all of those in check for laundry and check for dry cleaning. So that's gonna happen the week of December 1st through 5th. Sometimes you can get, if you're working a professional show, you can get your little laundry back, your dry cleaning back the next day. But in Santa Barbara, it takes a week. So then we go to the next item on the list here, which is show call. If we were going to be performing, and this is opening night on Saturday, we would be in dress rehearsals this week. So we would have dress rehearsals, which are numbers one through three. Dress, dress, dress. The first dress we do generally without makeup because their actors are so stressed that you're just running back and forth and they don't know how to get their clothes on and off, basically. And then if I have found that if we have them do makeup on the first night, the, sh the rehearsal will start late and they'll get makeup all over their, all their costumes. So we generally let them do one um, dress rehearsal and then we add makeup here. Then we have two previews. So that would be, oh, I don't even think previews are on here, but we do we do previews so that um, there are cheaper tickets and the audience can see something that's that's not that's prior to opening. They think they get a sneak peek. Technical rehearsals would be on that Saturday, so that sometimes there's one or two, and that's when you work through the whole show, starting before costumes. They would even work through it this week. 
but that doesn't affect the costume department because they're not wearing costumes yet. If they're wearing rehearsal costumes, we'll, we would have provided for those earlier. And once they start wearing performance costumes, there needs to be a costumer there so that the costumes are being tended to very well. The stage manager is responsible for rehearsal costumes and rehearsal props and getting all the furniture out and putting all the furniture back. So that's not a very secure person to take care of performance clothes because you don't, usually we only have one of and we don't wanna lose it or get it damaged. Sometimes on the day of the technical rehearsal, we do a makeup workshop. Sometimes that is scheduled by appointment earlier and on Antigone because we did fittings one person at a time and we did one per hour and we alternated dressing rooms and sanitized in between, then I could see them after their fitting. So if you have some kind of, I'm not even talking complicated makeup, but we work with a lot of community people who've never done any kind of makeup or we work with uh, people who don't have makeup and then they need to have time to buy something. So then when do you set up the dressing rooms? Because we have shows that, that would strike, let's say, yeah, you know, like strike here, we would set up the dressing rooms the week before technical rehearsals. So you're just, what you're doing is you're just making an ideal calendar. How long does it take? Usually on this day, the 20th, that, that is usually one week or two weeks before first dress is the time when we have crew view. And that's, this is crew view. That's when the actors will do the entire play, run through it without any kind of costume makeup. And sometimes they don't even have the real props. They are just running through it so the crew can get an idea of what this play is about and how it's gonna work. And that's not just costume crew. I have to find my water. This is the first time when the entire crew gets together and we, we meet with scenic, we meet with lighting crew, uh, run crews, uh, prop crew. Sometimes we've been working together with props to make sure something's gonna happen. Like when we had to do a knife stick, we had to stab somebody on stage and it had to stay in their body. And then we had to um, pull a knife out that had been stabbed into their body. And then there, somebody had to run around on stage with the knife sticking out of them. Those are things you have to choreograph long before this. So when you're looking at crew view, you're seeing do those things work. And then this is when the crew has their orientation. Here's what it means to be in crew. You're going to be here. We basically tell them you're going to be here for the next, you know, three weeks, 6 to 10 p.m. And so now we're working backwards, right, to this opening day. Now, that starts production. When you're in crew view, you're starting production and you're ending manufacturing. So how far out do we have design meetings? And that really depends on when the play is selected. So in this scenario, you can say, maybe you're having a design meeting here on, the, on uh, September 28th and that it's been cast by the third You'll have production meetings. We had production meetings every Tuesday at 11 until we finished uh, last week, until last week. So you can just put those in. And production meetings are the time when you talked with all the departments to see you have the director, the stage manager, the set designer, lighting designer, technical director, props, electrician, costumes, costume supervisor, sometimes wardrobe supervisor, 
so that you can uh, figure out where do we need dressing room spaces? Who's gonna have a quick change, something like that. So if we are cast, let's say we're cast on the third, then we're gonna take measurements on Monday, Tuesday. Now that gives us one, two, three, four weeks to get the show up. So you wanna have your measurements and get those done right away. The designs, if you're making something from scratch, the design can be in the shop far before that. You know, maybe the designers are meeting with the director or they've had some early meetings somewhere in here. So the designs often can come into the shop the minute the show is cast. Sometimes they come in before the show is cast. If you're making something from scratch, how long will it take to pattern? Depending on how many pieces and what size shop, but generally you can allow, you know, let's say you're going to allow a week. You're going to make a one uh, mock up. So you're doing MO made to order and you're going to do two of those. Your costume procurement plan shows that you're going to pull 90% of it. You're going to rent 8% and you're going to make 2%. So based on that, then when does the fabric need to be in the shop? Well, when the designs come in the shop, if you're pretty sure you know you're going to make something because it's a specialty item. And as the designer, you already have searched at what's available in stock and then you know what's available to rent. You can bring your fabric in right away. So see, this is not a linear path. This is just every item that needs to happen. So if your design meeting and your designs are doing shop here on the third, your fabrics can possibly be there by the fifth. So that can happen. And sometimes you wanna to wait to buy fabric just to make sure that you're not making something that's gonna really be horrible on someone's skin tone. And if you can do a color shift or something like that. Um, and then these next few things happen simultaneously. So the pulling and renting of stuff happens so that you can start fittings. And this is the next thing that goes into your list. When do you wanna have first fittings? Well, if your cast is here, you should have fittings the next week because that gives you the maximum time to do alterations. If you've done some patterning these first three days and a basic construction, which would be a mock-up or a toal in muslin or in the kind of fabric that is similar to what you are going to be making the garment out of, you wanna have that available. Anything that's going to be made to order, you want to have the initial pattern that is three-dimensional for the actor to put on at the same time as you're fitting all of the pulled and rented garments. That way, the made-to-order piece can go into production cutting and major construction at the same time as the pulled pieces can go into alterations. And that's important because you will have publicity pictures at some point, and you'll have to have clothes ready for that, and hopefully you'll have either something made or something that has been pulled will work. And I didn't even put that in here. So if you open, the 14th, publicity pictures are at least two weeks before. So you're gonna to have to have something camera ready by the 30th. So I try to do everything in one fitting and then only have a second fitting if it's made to order. So that means you really have to focus on that fitting so that everything, every question is answered. And that takes a lot of experience. When you first start, you might have to do a second fitting to get all the information and then you do a final fitting to make sure it's exactly the way you want it. Finishings are things that happen after the second fitting um, and sometimes even after the final fitting, but you know, like if you don't have your shoes, you wanna have the shoes for the first fitting so that you know what length things are going to be. Do you want it to touch the floor? How much off the floor? Like the red dress that I showed you, you know, we had to allow um, two inches off the floor. I'm just seeing how far off the floor we have it on the mannequin uh, so that she could walk. 
and go up and down stairs and be comfortable. And also she had to take her clothes off on stage. And I'm gonna actually go back and show you a couple of tricks that we did for that garment so that you can see how that works. Okay, questions on the calendar. Does that help, Cara? Yes, uh, very much so. So when you guys do productions that are at City College, uh, do you try to just pull everything from stuff you already have? Is that like the, the best case scenario? And then you kind of go like, how often do you have to rent stuff? How often are you making new pieces? Every show. Oh, wow. We make, usually we make something every show. We, we buy things, we rent. Um, for example, looking back, looking forward, all the girls' dresses were purchased for that show. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I knew I could do the men because I know our stock and I, know, I knew that I wanted to not use black or gray and I wanted to try and really push some color just because we wanted it to be upbeat. But I knew we did not have appropriate contemporary women's wear in the, um, here, let me just go back so we can see. We did not have appropriate women's wear in our costume storage because it's contemporary. Uh, we wanted a very classic, elegant, simple line. We had women that were five feet and women that were 5'10". You know, we have a five foot size zero woman and a 5'10 size six woman, and we have a 5'8 size 20 woman. So we wanted to make sure that the entire, we, by me, we, I mean myself and the director, we talked through what is the end result you want the audience to see. And so, you know, she wanted it to be an, a concert format and they would just add very few elements to create their character. So each one of those dresses was purchased. And then we had a fitting with everything, their undergarments, their slip, their tights, their everybody wore nude flesh mesh stockings. And then to have them be more supportive, they could wear support hose underneath that as well. And then nude, character shoes. So we had all those prepared so that when the dresses came in and they were cataloged ordered basically from Macy's and other places, um, then we fit them and several of them were shortened or taken in or different kinds of elements and then the jewelry was added. So that they each were individual, but there were there was a palette and there was a sort of a um, and not even a silhouette, but there was a palette and there was a feeling for each of the women so that they would look good and they'd be able to shine at their little character piece. Well, and I can imagine that those pieces are gonna be pretty valuable now to your stock because you can use them for yeah. so many different things. Yeah, for example, when we did, um, that's a, they're very classic. They could go for a number of different kinds of um, characters, you know, you can put a jacket on it. It could be a, it can be a businesswoman. It can be whatever. So it's really great. They're really, really good to add to our collection because contemporary is, is very hard because it's, it's of today. So you have to do something that looks like this year. But as far as, uh, when we did how to succeed in business in summer of 2019, I actually shopped a jobber who I've worked with her before, Catherine Nash. She's a, she's in Arizona. She is a vintage clothing shopper and has a wide variety of clothing. And we bought a number of 1960s pieces there that we used in the show, including men's suits, dinner jackets, women's ensembles. And then we made the Paris originals. We had to make 13 of those all matching, it's part of the joke of the show. And yet for the menswear, one of the things to give it that corporate 60s feel was white shirts. So we bought, I bought identical white shirts for each man. And because it's a musical and because they sweat, then we made sure that every man had two of them. So they had two undershirts 
and two white shirts so that if they sweated through it at intermission, they could put on their new clean white shirt. And white shirts were very indicative of corporate wear at that level in the 60s. They were starting to get some colored shirts in in collegiate wear and in uh, you know younger men's casuals, but not in corporate. So we had, you know, our white shirts were in bad shape. I wanted them to be identical because sort of that idea of stamped out. So we did that. Um, you know, and then different shows require different kinds of things. In that particular show, he has to rip off his coveralls from going from window washer to rip off his coveralls to have his suit on underneath to go directly into the um, boardroom and apply for a job. So that all has to be carefully planned. It's either made or in this case, we had a couple of different times we had to use that gag and the two guys were not the same size. So we actually just, we purchased um, mechanics jumpsuits and then we were able to alter them. You know, so it depends on the show. When we did the show that I showed you the red dress for, we made a lot of clothes for that. And we made them and I'll show you how we made that because that was a very smart, well, I think it was smart, but it was, it was very valuable for us because then we have a lot of pieces that we can use later. So let me reposition. So when a garment is designed like this, you have to know your end point. You have to know exactly what the director's thinking about on stage so that you know how the garment is gonna come off. And then the garment, will, this is a made to order garment. So this garment has to be made so that it looks period, but can come off on stage. So that's why that concealed zipper front is so important for this particular piece. And then he really wanted it to be the one and off. So the whole bodice and um, bustle came off. This overskirt was stitched to the underskirt. So that when she, when the back was loosened, this all came off in one. And we didn't want to send it to dry cleaning that way because it would get ruined. But um, Catherine's point about the cutter, that's why you do something in muslin first. Let's just take a look at this. So sometimes you can use the muslin and that's that generally works. Let me just get the glove off of here. But sometimes you can't and you have to recut. It depends on how good the cutter is. What I was looking for is to see if there were any marks that showed me if this garment was the original. So here's a here's one of the ways that we hooked this garment together is here's a big snap right here. And this I'll take off because this is just safety pinned on for the for the show. This was also indicated this this big bow which has stiffening in it. Okay. All right. So you can see that the full garment is lined with bias is, is uh, I mean, the edges are lined with bias so that it creates a nice smooth fit here. And this piece is what the cutter made and what we fit first. And that's why you're seeing, we generally do one inch in the back so that we can let this out for another person, a half inch on the curved seams and one inch in the front. So we could actually move this over and this could accommodate a person that is two inches bigger than this mannequin, okay? Because that's, we have significant space inside here. And this is folded back so that we could actually open this and create more room if we had somebody even this much bigger. 
And that way this garment can be used over and over. So you can see that the buttons are hands. I don't know if you can see that. The buttons are hand stitched by the zipper teeth, but not to interrupt where the zipper teeth are. And then they are truly hand covered buttons that are the Dupioni with lace overlay, which gives it additional depth and texture. And then the audience has no idea that they're not looking at something that's being um, undone, unbuttoned. And this was done with the two lines of basting, machine basting to gather. But I think what happened is it just, this got gathered in the front portion and this one got gathered in the back portion. And that could be just a stitcher. That was something that we didn't catch in the fitting and it must not have made the actor uncomfortable. So otherwise we would have changed that. And it, it's an odd, you can see that this is an odd shape anyway, because this is falls off the shoulder and restricts movement, right? You can't really lift your arms up. And actors are really, are really prone to do things like this. Oh, but I can't lift my arms up like this. And I said, Anne, you would never be lifting your arms up like that. So if you are in a period play, you need to have your body be period movement. Um, there's some act, there's some directors that don't want that. And there's some directors that want you to have, you know, con very contemporary movement. The movie Little Women was that way. So the the designer Jacqueline really Duran really worked with trying to get them to have a lot of uh, contemporary movement in period clothing, and then the clothing was made to accommodate that. Okay, questions? So a little, that's, that's why this whole crew handbook thing is really important. How much time do we have? Where do we have to go on stage? If this particular garment had to be made because it was so specific to the piece and she had to take it off on stage. Actually, we had several people that had to undress on stage we had, uh, it's called In the Next Room or the Vibrator Play. It's a play that's written by Sarah Rule, R-U-H-L. And it's about women who, uh, you know, in the, in the late 19th century, 1880s, you know, women were hysterical uh, if they couldn't breastfeed, if they couldn't, um, have sex if they couldn't do those things. And so it's really written by a woman about that period and about the, the um, ostracization and the whole male world of medicine and that women's issues were not understood at all. So it was very, very, very interesting. But we had a, we had to make a nursing corset because at one point we had a woman uh, there was a wet nurse that was hired for this woman's baby, and we had they had to show that she was nursing. So it was really interesting because it's a corset that is boned to here, and then it has, you know, like a nursing bra, it has a flap that comes over. And of course, all of it was completely modest, and you couldn't see anything underneath, but you have to make all of those adjustments as you're working with things. So, um, so yeah, pull from stock as this one was made to order as the bodice and the bustle was and also do some rentals. And we actually did rent a couple of coats for this particular piece because it had to go out into the rain. So questions? That's why that's, if you can do that calendar and figure out what you have based on your procurement plan, that's really important. And then, you know, remember that we talked about budgeting and we're budgeting a year in advance. So you have to read the play very carefully to figure out, wow, what do I actually have to be able to accommodate here? And, um, and of course, with looking back, looking forward, we didn't have, we, we didn't have a year. We didn't even have, I don't know, we had a few weeks <laughs> because we didn't know what to do. And so then it became, what are we gonna do? How are we going to perform something and then it was established that we, there were so many discussions about our, and are we gonna perform it outside? Are we gonna be able to perform it in the garment? Are we going to be able to get that together? 
So that's one thing we talked about in that lecture was Ben talked about uh, recording each of the actors individually, filming them individually, and then putting it together so it looked like everyone was on stage at the same time. But at each moment, everybody having a mask, everybody being behind plexiglass, so that the we wanted the audience to know that it was all safety protocols were being followed. Um, so that's why those women's dresses were were purchased. And they were purchased knowing, uh, and that's a, also a real, that is a real technical thing, as you all know from buying clothes for yourselves, it's very technical to buy clothes for somebody else based on a set of measurements and try and get the right size garment. So how many of you have you know, gone online, you think you know what your body is, you buy something and it fits first time, right? Maybe you buy two sizes to make it fit, but we really didn't have enough time to do that. So that's one of the things that's very, very important about when I had that discussion on fitting is that fit and measurements and how to read a measurement um, sizing sheet by a manufacturer and translate that into the measurements on the body. Very, very important. And that's what we would do in the costume technology too also. So Cara, you brought up a couple of other things that we need to do in there like budgeting and script breakdown and that's, and we do do that. So questions on that. Very good. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me that insight on how you'd like to see it. So now what we have in week nine, which, which is the modules from last week, which is our course overview and to do fabric identification we have these three crew handbook things that we discussed. I just grouped them together. And then to today, we are gonna put in catch up on fabric ID, which we did the crew handbook Antigone, just a second. Let me just publish this one thing, which is our overview, which I did publish. If I don't put it in the right place, it will, um, there. So that gives you this week so that we have Antigone costume choices complete, director approval. That's what you're, you're just gonna make sure that you have your, your images for that. Gather your supplies for your COVID mask. And I will publish that list, which I have published later so that I'll give that to you. And then Veterans Day next week, your Fabric Resource Notebook is due, and we'll discuss pattern, commercial patterns, layout instruction, and we'll discuss our patterns for the COVID mask. There's a whole section on the COVID mask, okay? And now, uh, then if we look at this module, you'll see that, I don't know why it doesn't go back to the module we're on. I wish that would do that. You'll see that then the crew handbook Antigone is all completely together. So as we have seen, crew handbook, crew handbook, crew handbook, here it is. Here's the assignment where to upload. And it kind of gives you a summary. And then this is where you can upload it on the 23rd, available today. And then the next thing in the module is to make sure that you watch Antigone and call for your student ticket. And it will start running on this weekend. Um, and then I'll, you'll have an assignment page for your upload for your play critique. Okay, so that's our that's where we're at with our modules. Better? Does that look better for everyone? Yes, that, that helps, thank you. Okay, so I realize now that um, it's hard when, we, when it's a long uh, project and it's introduced over several things, then maybe it's, you know, if you put them in two modules, it's, it's, um, it kind of trips up the system, but that way, at least I've grouped them all together now after the fact, so that now you can review that and it's due actually in two weeks from today. So that should give you enough time to look for it. And then next Monday, it'll say, you know, it's due the following week, okay? Um, 
so that's kind of what we have for today. I was going to look at the COVID mask thing and see if uh, what it says about getting your assignments together. I mean, your materials together. Basically, you just need a something that's a bandana size, which is about a 20 to, by 20. I have the uh, patterns for you all set. And that's basically from the New York Times with published it last uh, semester. And, and then it's a uh, how to make it. I'm going to see if I can show this to you. Yeah. And it tells you the materials that you need, just simple fabric. So let's take a look at that. This is published, this was published on your site. Since it says, get your materials together. Uh, wait, that's not what I want. Scooting that over, going to screen share. So this is the mask we'll make, and everyone can see, uh, you're looking at how to sew a fabric face mask, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this was published in the New York Times, you see March 31st, it was immediately after the whole coronavirus shut everything down. I looked at several different face masks, and this one seemed to be the one that was really straightforward, easy to make. You could make it both by hand and or by a sewing machine. And you can see that we're still in that same mode of guidance on whether to wear a face mask varies locally, but Center for Disease Control and Prevention has recommended that all Americans healthy and sick wear basic cloth masks in public. So, you know, March 31st, if we'd all been doing that for the last eight months, we might be in a different situation instead of in, instead of in super increasing COVID. So this is something that we need to do for our health, that we need to do for the health of others. And the great thing is when you make a cloth mask and you each have two pieces of fabric that are filters that are used in things like vacuum cleaners and these masks are washable. So you can put them in a lingerie bag like a bra or with your bra and you can simply wash them and dry them. Heat is one of the most important things for getting rid of the coronavirus as well as soap and water. So by using a cloth mask, be able to use soap and water and then heat to dry it, you're really hitting all the buttons there. So ideally you should have multiple um, masks and we're gonna show you how to make a very simple one. And this now is also the same, civilians should not use medical grade masks because now they are in short supply yet again. I just heard that on the radio, um, I think over the weekend. So this is the entire article which is published on your site. This is what you'll need for the pattern, needle and thread, a sewing machine if you have one. And I have a, I'm wearing mine that I did by hand, but I um, have published a a video on how you make one by hand and also how you have one on by machine. And I will demo it for you again. Scissors, pins are ideal. Safety pins and paper clips work. So here's what you need. This is, these are the supplies you should be gathering. Materials, at least a 20 by 20 inch of 100% cotton, um, such as a flat tea towel, but the uh, Bandana works perfectly and gives you enough for the four strips of cotton for fabric ties at the end of the bandana. One thing that I'm thinking about doing this time is I've cut the bottoms off of some t-shirts uh, for my kids. They want them shorter or some other way. And I'm thinking about doing t-shirt ties because they have a little bit of stretch to them. And that way you can leave them tied and put them up over your face and I'll, um, and I'll show you what I mean. Or flat, clean shoelaces or elastic. Now that's to put it around your ear. And I have found that my ears are bothered by that. So again, if you have a bandana, all of your materials are 
contained in a bandana or in a 20 by 20 piece of 100% cotton fabric. So prepare your materials. It talks about how to cut it. You should wash it and dry it on the highest heat so that it is um, clean and measure it nine and a half by six and a half. And that is, the, that is the size of the filter that you have. So that is your pattern. And it discusses the pattern ties where we're gonna do all this in class. You're gonna work with me on it. And that way you won't have to worry about how to do it yourself. For one thing, I would never pin this way. That was a guarantee to have it fall out. But you can see it's very step-by-step. Step. You stitch it around and we will go forth. And then you turn it inside out and you have your four pieces. Then we'll do our pleating and I have a lecture on pleating for you as well. And then you finish. So you have these fabulous face masks and I'm gonna show you mine. And here's, you can download a printable face mask tutorial which is just the printed version of this from here. So there you go. Uh, I, yeah. I know we're gonna do this together, but have you published this yet? I, let me see. I don't think I published it yet. Okay, I just wanna make sure I wasn't missing something. Yeah, well, I, I, we're not doing it even next week. So I- Okay, perfect. Let me just see if this, no, no, that's, that's not it. I, um, I can publish it. Let me just, let me just, uh, I can certainly, let me just publish that right now. I, either way, I just want to make sure I wasn't missing it. Today, you know, and, uh, oh, it says as of October 28th. So maybe it was published. Oh, I don't need to add. Maybe it was there, but it just wasn't published. So I'll, it will now be in there, but this is with an old video. Okay. Let me find it because it's going to be down here. It usually is in the very, very end. Construction mass project. So that's that's down here. I will move it up for you. To next week, so you can take a look at it. And I'll move up the video. There you go. <clears throat> I have to publish that week for you to be able to see everything. Okay, I, there's actually something I wanted to show you and it's a really funny um, video about a face mask. So I was, I was looking for that and I will show it to you as soon as I find it because it, it is about making a face mask. So let me just get to that page and we'll see it. So are, um, does anyone else need to have fabric for their face mask? Because I'm gonna be mailing Kara a bag, to, a little package today. No? I'm all set, Pam. Okay, very good. Plenty and of fabric. Victoria? Smenson. Do you need fabric? Yeah, I, I think so. I, but I can pick it up when I meet you. Okay, so make sure you remind me mm -hmm. because otherwise I won't, I won't be able to. Okay, all right. Uh, I wanna show you this funny video, which was on YouTube about making a face mask and it's, I first saw it 
and I wasn't really sure it was a comedy, but um, that's why I'm, I'm trying to look for it because it is really, it's really quite cute. So let me, uh, let me see it. Oh, here we go. Okay. It's just a very short thing that you can take a look at. Ready? This is Mongolia, and we are not a the only company in the world. Hi there, I'm Kay Pruitt, and I'm going to be making some face masks for my family today. And I thought I'd bring y'all along and show you just how simple and easy these little face masks are to make. You do not have to be an expert sewer. I am certainly not. Um, I've actually borrowed some of this stuff from my sister-in-law, but I promise you if I can make a face mask, so can you. All right, let's start sewing. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing we want to do is cut out two square pieces of fabric that are nine by six inches. I've made myself a little pattern. You're just going to lay it on top of your fabric and then we start cutting. And that's it. You just start following around. <laughs> See, that's what I get for not wanting to wear my glasses on camera. Uh, so we're just going to cut all the way around your little bit. You don't even need pin. <laughs> So we're going to cut out two of these squares and then we'll meet back up when we're done. Okay, we have our squares cut and ready to go and I'm going to set those aside. And now we are going to cut our elastic. I'm going to use this little tool this time. And we need to measure out seven inches. And I have a handy little ruler right here on the bottom of my mat that I'm going to use. So seven inches. They make these numbers so small. <laughs> there it is. Seven inches, and I'm just gonna cut that. Great, and I'm gonna do a second one. Seven, seven inches. There we are. Okay. Okay. All right, so I've got my elastic cut, I've got my two seven inch strips and that'll go around our ears and we are ready to sew. Okay, we have our two squares of fabric facing each other and we've laid down our elastic uh, up to the corner sticking out like a piece of bacon in a BLT. Or if you are vegan, um, a nut, and now you're ready to sew. <laughs> Slow that down just a little bit. Before you get to the end of your fabric, you reach through and then you're going to take your elastic. Oops, I think I just sewed my shirt. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I think you got a little skin. Okay, so I had a little snafu back there, but it's okay. I was able to save my fabric and finish hand stitching the other seams, leaving a little opening at the top so that I could turn it inside out and we could put the final touches on our washable, reusable face mask. <laughs> okay, um, we aren't going for perfection here. We are going for protection. Um, these don't have to be pretty, y'all. They just have to cover your mouth and your nose. Oh. 
That was awesome. So I'm sure you uh, noted the glass of wine in the far right corner. <laughs> Anyway, uh, your mask will not turn out that way. And the rotary color cutter that she used for the elastic is actually, I find those to be much sharper. The scissors, we are going to use pins. It will not be like that. So just know that, you know, a lot of people are making them and it's kind of, it, it's something you can have fun with. And really, you can get them done in less than an hour. They are really quite wonderful. I'll take a long time and explain every single step. But once you get one done, you can make another one very, very simply. So I will work on publishing every single part of the COVID mask. There is a um, video from before, from the what we did in the spring on there, if you wanted to look at it first, but we'll do our own video as we meet on our Zoom class. Okay, so any questions? because we you can I'm gonna make one to go with every outfit <laughs> Nancy Pelosi you and Nancy Pelosi <laughs> go there so yeah and how about that cold weather huh you guys yeah it feels good Cara how cold is it in Vegas now it's pretty cold it's shifted again so it's like 48 during the day uh between 48 and 53 I think so it's pretty chilly. I'm not ready for it. Freezing at night then? Not yet. Uh, there's snow on the mountains. We got a little sprinkle yesterday. Uh, it's not quite that cold, but, you know, it went from 95 to like 50 one day. And then now it's, it's staying pretty low, but. That's quite a swing. Yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, I still feel like we didn't get a summer because of COVID. So I'm still just really bitter about it and not ready for <laughs> cold weather. I, yeah, we I all need got to, cheated. <laughs> yeah, I need to like stop wearing my sundresses and actually get my Uggs out, but I don't want to, so. Okay, that's funny. Um, so I just wanted to let you know one thing about your Zoom site, if you don't know this. When you are making a recording or if you are doing something, you can highlight the box and you can hide your self view. So you don't have to look at yourself while you're doing this. And sometimes that's better. And then you can just turn your show your self view on. And then if you're looking in gallery view where we see everyone, when people are not having their video on and they just have their name, then you can go to the three dots up in the corner of their name screen or their name plate and you can hide non-video participants so that your view can be speaker and you can even hide the speaker view so that you are really not staring at yourself but you're just then seeing what's happening and what the recording is so just so you know since we've been on view zoom for quite a while and it is a tool that we're using more and more, that idea of being able to hide the non-participants sometimes can give you a better recording and can help you look at things. And then when you wanna have a conversation, then put it in gallery and have everybody turn their screen on and we can see everyone. So remember Wednesday is a day off and we have a little bit of a shorter class today so that you can work on your crew handbook, get your COVID supplies together for your making your COVID mask, and I will mail cars to you, Victoria. Make sure you check and see that you have everything that you need. And everyone else, please check and make sure that you have everything that you need. Or if you need something mailed, let me know. And then finish up your fabric identification. All right. Anything else? Nice. I will see you on Monday. Have a great vacation. And remember our veterans. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Have a good one. Thanks, Pam. Thank Bye. you. Bye.